The smell of spent gasoline and day-old garbage assaulted Derek as he stepped out onto the street. He always waited till sunset to head to McLeod's. That was when the best prospects were out. Derek had wanted the alcohol almost an hour before sunset, but he knew that if he intended to go to bed with someone tonight, he needed to pace himself. A woman might accept a man's advances if she was drunk, but they would rarely spend time with a strange drunk while they were sober. This was a lesson that Derek had learned early on, and it was likely the only thing that had stopped him from being a full-blown alcoholic. His phone chirped, and Derek fished it out, wanting to see what cutie was texting him so early. He sighed when he recognized Charlene's number, though, asking if he would be at the bar tonight. Charlene, the one-night stand who wouldn't take a hint. He had slept with her about five months ago, and the sex hadn't been worth the constant dodge he had to run with her now. Despite his better judgment, he'd taken her out a few times since their hookup, but he never took her to bed again. Derek didn't do seconds, and he put the phone back in his pocket, knowing that he'd have to cut her off soon. Besides, he had other prospects these days. As he rounded the corner, Derek couldn't help but see the spotlights in front of the old warehouse that had once been a cannery. The man standing out front was doing his best to catch people's interest but more of them were heading on without a second look. Derek could feel the urge to drink, almost as strong as the urge to bury someone who lived rent-free in his head in alcohol, but he stopped for a moment as he looked at the sign strung over the door of the warehouse. Derek scoffed as he read it. A truly frightening experience or your money back. What bullshit. The man looked like the titular carnival barker. His jacket was black with red thread to accent the cuffs and collar, not to mention the garish gold buttons that glimmered from his dark cloak. He was tall, and he wore a large black hat with a handlebar mustache, and his grin made Derek think that he was not to be trusted. He stood before what looked to be a very old and decrepit warehouse, a place Derek had driven by a thousand times and never looked at twice. Now it was hung with streamers and cast in the buttery light of two spotlights. The windows of the warehouse danced with murky half-light, like a fire slowly burning out, and the lack of screaming or giggling teenagers coming out of the front made Derek very wary. This time of year, an empty haunted house was always suspicious. Come one, come all, see your greatest fears realized, or your money back. Derek fixed the man with a disbelieving eye. That's so. Oh yes, young man. But be warned, this haunted house is likely to be unlike anything you've ever experienced before. This house will show you things that you didn't know about yourself and tap into what truly scares you. Derek scoffed, but he fished out a 20 on a crumpled 5 and laid it in the box. It's better be worth it. The barker smiled toothily as he slid the bills into the lockbox. I can assure you, sir, it will be well worth every penny. As Derek went inside, his phone chirped again. He stepped into the entryway and looked down, seeing a picture of an empty bar stool with a text that asked where he was. Charlene appeared to be waiting to ambush him at his favorite watering hole. He considered just going home and drinking the vodka he'd been ignoring in the fridge since he'd come from work, but decided that he wouldn't let her stop him from having a good time. Maybe tonight was the perfect opportunity to break it off with her and make it stick. Derek stepped into the cloud of smoke as a nearby fog machine belched its payload and was suddenly surrounded by an active bar scene. It was pretty well done. It looked just like McLeod's on 11th, a favorite watering hole of his. This was where he often picked up the best trim and it was the place he would likely find himself at later tonight. Derek didn't like to go to bed alone or sober. When he was alone and sober with his thoughts, he inevitably thought of her. He groaned as he walked up to the bar, wondering if this was one of those religious haunted houses by the Mothers Against Drunk Driving. It had all the earmarks, after all. Hazy bar, people milling about, shadowy corners where bad actors were just waiting to jump out and startle you. Derek couldn't believe he'd just given money to one of these religious nuts and their revival miracle tent. He supposed he couldn't be angry. The man had offered a full refund when he got out. Derek might as well see what there was to be seen and then get his 25 bucks back. He approached the bar, 
not imagining they had any alcohol, but willing to play along. The man behind the counter was dressed in the usual attire that Thomas always wore. Thomas seemed to love dressing like the odd man out in a barbershop quartet. Suspenders, handlebar mustache, striped waistcoat, shiny black shoes, immaculately coiffed hair. As he approached the bar, however, he noticed something a little different. His face looked like someone had used an eraser to make it a flesh-colored smudge. He looked up at Derek, silent as the grave, as he stared eyelessly at him. Derek tried to order a gin and tonic, but the not Thomas just shrugged and went back to what he was doing, turning away from Derek as he got back to work. Hey, I'm talking to you, Derek yelled, but as he tried to reach over the bar and grab the not Thomas by the sleeve, the man walked away and went to serve some of the other oddly smudged individuals at the end of the bar. They all had that weird thing going on with their face. Was this some kind of theme, maybe? Derek didn't understand. He sighed as he sat back down, waiting for the bartender to come back around again. The smudged Thomas clone was more like the real Thomas than he knew. He and Thomas had gotten into a fight three days ago, and Derek's reception at McLeod's had been icy ever since. It was Thomas's fault, really. If he wanted to bed Jeanette, then he should have made his move. Derek wanted her, Thomas wanted her, but Derek had struck out first, and now Jeanette was just another notch on his bedpost. The problem was that when Jeanette realized she had been nothing but an evening's distraction for Derek, she had switched to one of the other dive bars in town, and now Thomas blamed him for running her off. Don't know what I expected or why I bother talking to you, Thomas had said. It's like being mad at a dog for eating your sandwich. He's a hungry mutt that only knows he wants to eat. Seems like the bartender might be a little upset with you. Derek jumped and glanced over at a familiar-looking brunette who had sat down beside him. She was dressed in a short black dress, her leggings artfully ripped, and her shiny black hair hanging in her face. When she smiled, he could see her teeth were slowly slipping into unevenness, but he found it charming somehow. The longer he looked at her, the more familiar she seemed, and less like anyone he had ever known. You must have slept with some girl he liked. She was drinking something through a straw with a distinctly fruity smell, but the thickness and the color reminded him more of a bag of blood. As he watched it slide up the straw, he felt a little sick to his stomach. He could see her throat working as she drank, her eyes closing as she enjoyed it, and Derek was powerless to break her stare as, as much as he wanted to look away. As a trickle ran down the corner of her mouth, he finally found the strength to clear his throat and glance around the smoky bar. This was definitely the oddest haunted house he had ever been to, and he was beginning to doubt his previous suspicions of a religious experience. Do, uh, do I know you? he asked, scanning the bar to see if there was someone else he knew here. The girl was cute, but looking at her made him feel weird in a way he hadn't in a long time. She grinned as she drank, the soupy sound of her drink disappearing up the straw and making his skin crawl. It was like listening to someone drain a corpse with a bendy straw. Not for long, though you think of me often enough. In a way, I'm the reason you do the things that you do. I'm never far from your mind, though you wish I wasn't. You can try to drink me away, Derek, but I'll never truly be gone. Derek laughed, but there was no mirth in it. He was thinking that the woman had captured his earlier thoughts perfectly. <laughs> Do you always talk in riddles to people you just met at a bar? He turned back, but something was different about her. Had she been wearing glasses before? They didn't really fit the elegant dress she was wearing. They were the thick kind, the kind that librarians wear, the kind that are more function than form. She was still pretty, but the glasses looked like a prop on a well-dressed young woman rather than something that she needed. Only to people who can't understand plain speech. His phone buzzed, and Derek checked to see that Charlene had sent him another text. She wanted to know where he was and how he was, to let him know that she was thinking about him. She was so clingy. Why couldn't she just take the hint? Didn't she realize that he wasn't just being coy when he went home with other women? That he wasn't playing hard to get when he didn't return her calls or answer the door? She wanted to lock him down, but he couldn't stay with her. He'd... He'd start seeing that body as it lay in the casket, hear her words as she told him she was leaving, and the only thing that would make it go away would be another drink or another conquest. I'd like to say you've grown into a fine man, but we all know it isn't true. 
You've changed very little since high school. I doubt you ever will. Well, that's something to work with. Did we go to high school together then? Were you one of the little nerdlets that I never called back? Maybe some one night stand I ghosted after I was done? He squinted at her. Had she had the pimples when they first started? He had only looked away for a second, but she had just the slightest hint of acne across her cheeks, like a dusting of freckles. They weren't the livid pustules of a teen experiencing their first crop, but the last light kiss of puberty that an 18-year-old might experience before they simply dried up and were no more than a momentary problem after that. She smiled as she noticed him noticing them, and he thought again that her teeth seemed odd. Had she once had braces, maybe? Oh no, we were never very intimate. I think you would have liked to be, but... She paused long enough to take a sip of her drink, the liquid having returned by some unnoticed bartender. You were so painfully shy around me. You could speak confidently to any cheerleader or popular girl in school, but you were utterly befuddled by me and my braces and my glasses. Derek was speechless. This girl couldn't be who she was claiming to be. Lisa was... I I'm sorry, Derek said, glancing over and seeing someone he hoped he recognized. I see someone else I know. I, I should really go say hi to them. He slid off the bar stool and took off on wobbly legs before almost spilling himself onto the ground. The young woman, younger now than she had been at the start, smiled at him as she showed off a mouthful of metal. Take your time, Derek. I don't have anywhere to be. I'll be waiting for you. I'm always waiting for you, she said, throwing the last at Derek's back as he rushed off into the small crowd. He thought the woman's name was Cindy, or maybe Chelsea. He only recognized her from the back because that was the most memorable image he had of her in his head. Her blonde hair was still long and soft as it rolled down her back, and when he approached, she was talking with a small group of other hazy people. Their faces seemed scrunched, their features swirled in the same eraser marks that everyone else had, and when he touched her, she turned around slowly. Thank God, Cindy. Did the guy on the sidewalk talk you into this little... But he stopped when he saw her face. Her face was as smooth and featureless as the others, and she took one look at him and walked away into the crowd. Cindy, he called, taking a step towards her before catching sight of a familiar brown ponytail as its owner leaned over the bar. Mary was a staple at McLeod's. She might have been a little too old for Derek, her status as a cougar established before Derek had even had his first drink, but she'd been sweet for an evening. He batted at the ponytail playfully, waiting for her to turn around so he could ask her what the hell was going on here. She had been a little icy to him since they slept together, but surely she would help him figure this out before he had a freaking breakdown. She turned around angrily when he batted her braid, and Derek saw that she was also smooth and featureless from eyebrows to chin. She huffed and took herself elsewhere, and as Derek watched, he became aware that most of the people in the bar were women who looked familiar. One night stands, old girlfriends, sexual conquests of every flavor, all of them milling about like they couldn't see him, and even if they could, they couldn't care less. They pressed in as their numbers swelled, but Derek remembered them all. It was impressive and depressing how many women you could sleep within a six-year period, and Derek found he was adrift in a sea of jaded barflies. They had their own tidal pull, and as Derek tried to push his way to the door, they seemed to pull him back towards the bar with each push he made to escape them. Then, someone wrapped a hand around his and pulled him back to the bar stool, and he accepted it without protest. It was... it was the not Lisa, and she looked a lot more familiar now. She wore the same ripped leggings and puffy sweater dress that she had worn the night of the party. The leggings were no longer just artfully ripped. Derek could see the glass shards and torn skin beneath them. The sweater was dotted with red splotches, and he might have thought she'd been shot if he hadn't known what had killed her. The left lens of her glasses was a spider web, pristine ice broken by a stray rock, and he remembered that. After all, they had buried her in those glasses, and he remembered it being the only imperfection as she lay there in her casket. It was the only real thing about her after the coroner had done his work of making her beautiful again. Why are you here? Derek asked, watching the throng of women as they surged around the bar he was sitting on. It's... it's not enough. 
that I live with your ghost every day. Now I have to see you here, too? Oh, gee, I'm sorry that I'm the stick that you jab yourself with on every occasion. Unfortunately for you, I'm your greatest fear. Not me, not really, but what I represent. You can't let yourself be close to anyone like you were with me. You can't open yourself up and embrace intimacy. In a way, I'm the manifestations of your issues with that intimacy. You bury your fears and woes in an endless stream of sex and are never satisfied. No matter how much you drink, how many women you go to bed with, you'll never lose my ghost. Not unless you let yourself forget me. His phone buzzed again, and he saw that Charlene had texted him. Her message was a little different this time. She told him she was sorry for bothering him so much, and how she'd stopped trying to insert herself in his life. She apologized for not being enough for him, and hoped that he had a good night. Derek looked at the phone, feeling his stomach knot as he thought about how he had run off another one. She seems nice. Maybe you could give her a chance. I can't. What if... What if I let her down like I let you down? What if I accidentally kill her, too? Lisa smirked, and it did interesting things to her broken face. You blame yourself for my death, but did you really have anything to do with it? Derek scoffed. How had he not caused her death? He'd been too focused on drinking and partying to make sure that his girlfriend had gotten home safely. He had stood right there and let her leave with someone else instead of taking her himself. Why do you think that's your fault? I would have left regardless. You no more caused my death than the tree we hit did. Let it go. Derek could see that night, the same night he always saw when it haunted his nightmares. He had been at Marty Jenner's party, the one he held every Christmas break, and Derek was drunker than he'd ever been. Lisa didn't drink. He had dragged her to this party mostly so he could show off his new girlfriend and it was pretty clear to everyone but Derek that she was done with it. When he tried to kiss her, she had pulled away, telling him that his breath smelled like rotten fruit. He told her not to be such a prude, and she had told him that she was leaving. Kyle Warren, one of the guys on the football team with Derek, had been leaving too. He was less drunk than Derek, but that wasn't saying much. Derek had still been hung over the next day when his mother had come to give him the bad news. Kyle had wrapped his vehicle around a tree three blocks from his house killing both of them instantly. Derek had never forgiven himself for that, and he'd stayed pickled for the rest of his life. Looking at Lisa now made him feel even worse. Forget about it. Forget about me. Stop torturing yourself. You had nothing to do with my death. Let yourself be happy, and let go before it's too late. She swam before his eyes, and it was only then that Derek was aware he was crying. His phone chirped again, and he saw that Charlene was calling him this time. As he picked it up, he saw the women part, leaving him a clear path for the exit. Give her a chance. A real chance. Let yourself be happy for a change. Derek left, apologizing for being so distant, as he and Charlene made plans to meet up at McLeod's in about half an hour. So, said the barker, as Derek stepped onto the street, did you discover something truly terrifying? Derek nodded. Yeah, I think I might have also found something I'd lost, too. Derek dropped another 20 onto the box and walked away, as the barker smiled and watched him leave shakily. Another satisfied customer. Good evening, everyone. It's me, Dr. Plague. Thank you so much for joining me for tonight's video. If you enjoy the channel, why not go ahead and subscribe? Maybe hit that notification bell so you don't miss any of the spooky stuff we do here. Maybe leave a comment, too, if you feel so inclined. Me, and of course the algorithm, always like when you interact. How about another video? I'm sure you could be down for that. Why not click on one of the videos above and get a little more spooky today? If you'd be interested in getting a copy of my latest book, there's a link below. There's also a link to my Reddit page where you can read some of my other stories that I've put out. Before we go, let's go ahead and thank our wonderful patrons. Thanks to Janet for being our spooky skeleton tier contributor. And thanks to Zoronan, Emily Coltsfoot, Leslie Lou Riddle, Martha, and Marianne Schuler for being our Ghostly Reader tier contributors. Thanks to you all, we just couldn't do the show without you. If you'd like to support the show, then I always recommend you come on down to Patreon. For just $5 a month, you can take advantage of all the wonderful things we do there. There's all kinds of unique content that you only get if you're part of my Patreon, so come on down and see what all the fuss is about. And as always, thanks for stopping by. Dr. Plague, signing off. Have a wonderful evening.